And yes, okay, so everything ready. Again, three wines, we are going to taste them at the very end, okay? Don't worry about that. I will describe the wines thoroughly so you can guess. I don't know what the wines are either. Well, I know what they are, I don't know the order. So when um, my husband Guilherme was packing the wines, he said to me, what is the order? And I said, okay, I don't wanna know. So, you know, just wrap the wines in foil, send it to me as well as you're sending to other people and other clients. So that is the way that I have the wines, okay? So three red wines, same grape, same producer, same country. So I didn't receive anything from the producer to use his wines. The reason that I chose this producer is because it is the same grape in three different um, methods, okay? And we are going to, to talk about that at the end. All right, so, um, okay, let me go ahead and welcome you guys to the fermentation vessel and impact on final wine quality and style. So the reason that I, I decided to do this webinar is because of my studies with the Master of Wine, I'm learning so much about this impact and I wanted to share. And also because now I see producers um, doing more, you know, amphora or cement or, you know, eggs. So I wanted to, to talk to you a little bit about that, okay? So again, this is a webinar format. So that means that you can see me and hear me, but I cannot see you or hear you. So if you have any questions, please use the chat box, okay? And for those of you who don't know me, if, you're, if it is your first time here, welcome. It's um, very good to have you. If you are a former student, great to have you always. So my name is Alessandra Steves. I am a stage two master of fine candidate. I have the diploma, the level four of the WSET. I am a Bordeaux tutor, French wine scholar, certified specialist of wine. And I am the director of wine education for Florida Wine Academy here in Miami and 305 Wines. So we do have a small wine shop in South Miami, in Palmetto Bay. Most of you have been there. Um, thank you for the support. So, so yes, I'm, I'm the wine buyer. So every time that I see things like this, oh, the same producer doing concrete, uh, amphora, oak. Okay, what a great thing for a webinar. So that is how I get my ideas, okay? So a um, little bit about us. So Florida Wine Academy, we are the largest provider of uh, WSET courses in the Southeast United States. Uh, we teach WSET, Wine Scholar Guild, SAC Sommelier Association, and um, a lot of fun webinars as well. For instance, Nicole Ramos, who is here today, and she's on the chat, she is teaching a sparkling rosé webinar tomorrow. And that'll be really fun because uh, there are three wines to taste. So uh, looking forward to that as well. Um, 305 Wines, it's um, online and now brick and mortar wine shop in South Miami. Vino Summit is a wine conference that we organize every year. Uh, we didn't do this year, but you know, hopefully coming back in 2022. And Miami Champagne Week is definitely confirmed for this year. We will do a series of events between the um, week of what, 11 to 15 of October. So save the date um, and you will hear a little bit more about that later, okay? All right, so let's go into it and discuss a little bit about our fermentation options in here, okay? So this webinar will be more directed at red wines, but I will comment on some options for white wines as well, okay? So first of all, oak barriques. Um, everybody, you know, when you travel, when you go to wine regions, we all see the barrels. So that is very traditional for aging and for fermentation of whites. Um, oak barriques can be, you know, French oak, American oak, um, and they can be new, they can be old. So that is very common. You all have seen that. One thing that I have to comment is that um, red wines usually do not ferment in oak barriques, okay? And that is because red wines have the skins 
uh, with its skin, seed, and all of that inside a tiny oak barrick doesn't make any sense. It is a lot of work. You cannot do the cap management. So therefore, oak barriques for fermentation is more common with uh, white wines. Having said that, there is always um, an exception to the rule. So I have seen producers in California saying, my wine has 200% new oak barrels. And I asked 200%, how is that possible? So the person, the winemaker said, oh no, we ferment in 100% new oak barrels. And then when we do the aging, it is new, 100% new oak barrels. So, um, so 200% new oak barriques, okay? All right, oak vats, they are larger ones. So red wines can definitely be fermented in large oak vats, very common. And you know, in, in different countries, you have different names. So foudres in French, Fuda in German, then you have, you know, the Botti for the Italian ones. Um, so all of those are oak vats. We will see some pictures later. So, you know, aids um, in visualizing. Cement tanks, um, that is very common as well for winemaking, especially for red wines, and we are going to see it a little later. Stainless steel, which is, you know, super easy to clean, great to control, give bright, fresh fruits. So, you know, very common for whites, reds, roses, sparkling. So stainless steel is definitely very much used. And then we have amphora, which is something that is old and new at the same time because the technology is very old, but you know, now it is in fashion again, okay? Glass bottles, definitely important for fermentation. Remember that traditional methods, sparkling wines are fermented in glass bottles, right? So champagne. Uh, and then finally, plastic tanks. And plastic tanks are common as well. So easy to clean. Uh, they do not impart any flavor or anything, but um, some producers in different areas in the world do use um, plastic tanks, okay? Not plastic bottles like it is in here in the picture, but plastic tanks, reinforced plastic kind of. So, so you have all these options and why would you choose one instead of the other one, okay? So, now for this fermentation and aging options, what happens is, is that that will impact the style of a wine. So how a wine look, how it smells, how it tastes, it is also impacted by the fermentation vessel, okay? Also has an impacting quality. So, you know, some vessels like oak will bring complexity, will make a longer finish. Some others might bring some balance and concentration. So all of this can impact the quality of our wine as well. And then we have to think about the price. What kind of wine am I producing? If it is a high-end wine, okay, I have the budget to put some new oak, right? So yes, bring me French oak barrels from the best forest and the best cooperage because I have the budget. Now, if I'm producing a low-end wine, maybe, you know, stainless steel tanks or concrete vessels will be better for me, okay? And then you have tradition and history. So, you know, think about that. If you are in Georgia and they always have used amphoras, you will continue the tradition by using amphora. Um, and then Appalachian laws. So even if you are, let's say, in Brunello di Montalcino, and you say, I don't want to use any oak. I only want to use, you know, stainless steel tanks or clay amphora. You cannot because the law mandates that you age the wine in wood, okay? So those Appalachian laws, they kind of restrict what you can do and you cannot do. So, so think about that. It is more than, you know, just being fashionable and thinking, oh yes, I like oak. Now I like amphoras. It is, it has a lot to do, okay? So, um, so yes, different things um, and, and, you know, decisions will depend on multiple things in here, okay? All right, so um, let's go quickly into history and see, you know, how did Romans do? 
So first of all, the first record that we have is the um, Quevery, which is the amphora in Georgia, um, 6,000 BC. So, and I'm gonna talk about that in a second on the next slide. But then in the first century um, AD, we had, you know, this dolium used by Romans and the pitoi, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, used by the Greeks. And those were pottery kind of amphoras, just like you see here in the picture, okay? So they used that um, to ferment the wines. And only as of uh, the second century, they begin using wood. So the pottery and all these earthenware, <clears throat> excuse me, jars were used for fermentation and maturation and for holding the wine together, okay? So a little later comes um, wood, okay? So now, Take a look at this beautiful pictures from Georgia. And, um, and you know, if you are curious about the wines of Georgia, there is now a book. Um, there is the website, winesofgeorgia.com. We do have two wines uh, at 305 Wines and we tasted this two weeks ago, it was quite interesting. So, but they have this, this ancient tradition of um, using quevery, you know, both spellings are correct. And I found both spellings at the Wines of Georgia website. So, and those are made with clay and they are used for <clears throat> fermentation, storage and aging of the wines, okay? These caveries are buried um, underground. So what you see here on the second picture that is how, you know, these uh, quaveries are. So they are buried underground and that will maintain the temperature. They can be anywhere from 100 liters to 3,500 liters, so quite big. So, um, you know, it's very cool to see here in the second picture because all the work that has to be done, you know, like punching down or something you're doing to something that is below you because it is underground. Um, and that has, replicate, has been replica, replicated in um, different countries in the world as well. Even Grafner in Italy uses um, those type of amphoras and then, you know, buried underground. So very ancient tradition and a very interesting one as well, okay? So Patra is asking, what is the difference between the amphora and the terracotta? Um, so from what, so the amphora is the shape and terracotta is, um, is the material. So what they say is that clay and terracotta are very similar in, in terms of what they bring to the wine. Clay, um, terracotta is kind of the, the baked clay. So it is more red um, kind of clay. So, but that is the material and amphora is just the shape of the vessel. Okay, hope that's, that helps. Okay, so that was history, you know, so we begin with the quaveries, um, the amphoras for the Romans, um, wood, and wood was used uh, for a very long time. Um, and it was, you know, basically the means of transportation of goods. So everybody was using uh, wood, okay? Now, nowadays, um, let's see what is being used in the modern world. So first, we have to start with concrete. And uh, concrete is a very, very important um, type of uh, materials, material, because concrete is porous. So it allows for some micro oxygenation and that will soften the tenants. So normally uh, when you go visit vineyards, um, you see a lot of concrete tanks for red wines because of that, it holds the temperature. It has this kind of thermal properties that allows for this slow and steady fermentation because cement as a material or concrete, it takes longer to warm up and then to cool down, okay? So, um, 
what people say about concrete is that it makes for a very pure wine. So, you know, you taste the fruits, um, so very pure wine. In the picture in here, so this is Petrus, Chateau Petrus in Bordeaux. So very, you know, kind of um, what do you expect from, you know, older tanks. And this to the right is Sterling Vineyards in California. And, you know, so you see the shape is different. It is very modern. And you even nowadays you can um, customize and you can put the light just like in here, LED lights to make it fashionable. So, so nowadays the concrete tanks are, you know, super fashionable. Um, the other thing about concrete tanks is that um, in the past, they were lined with, with epoxy or, you know, kind of a food grade type of material. Um, and then, you know, if you needed to, to, um, to wash it or to clean it, you would scratch down uh, the material, you know, use water and that's it. But nowadays, a lot of people are using kind of raw concrete. They call it nude concrete. So that is different. Um, and, and, you know, so, so you have more of the micro oxygenation because the wine is in direct contact with the concrete. Um, so it is super interesting what is happening nowadays, okay? So have you guys traveled, you know, to some places and seen concrete tanks? Let me know if you have, because usually, you know, if you have been to Bordeaux, it's all you see. So yes, Lisa and Carl, they are saying Mendoza, definitely, you know, big red wine producer. So it makes sense, okay, to see that. So, so yes, um, Nicole is saying is a lot in the vineyards in Tuscany. Yep. So um, very cool compared to the Bati, uh, the big oak barrels. So, so yes, concrete. And, and then, you know, think about that. Concrete lasts, lasts forever, right? With oak, you always need a new one, but concrete um, needs, you know, no replacement. Aga is saying that she saw concrete tanks in Sequoia Grove. Yes, absolutely. So any, you know, very good producer of uh, red wine will have concrete tanks. So let me show you also what is new in terms of concrete. So nowadays what we are seeing is different shapes, but still using concrete or cement, okay? So I know it, this is very geeky. You know, maybe if I have an engineer in here, he will feel um, not as geeky, but there is a difference between concrete and cement, okay? So cement is kind of the lighter material, is more porous. And concrete is when you mix cement with sand and gravel. So it is really hardy. Um, so both are used in the industry, okay? So concrete, think about those tanks that, you know, are heavy and um, are there. And then cement is the kind of the eggs in here. So these are cement eggs. Um, the picture on the left in here with these beautiful tanks that are, have, you know, kind of, I don't know, this shape. Um, these are Chateau Prior Lichine in Margot. Um, and then the eggs, you know, are becoming more and more, um, use everywhere, okay? So the thing about the eggs is they say that the eggs, um, and that I have heard from different winemakers. I have seen the eggs in Bordeaux. I seen them in Napa. I have seen in so many different places. So what they say is that fermenting inside an egg brings um, the cap management is easier. Because think about that, when you have red wines, you have all these skins, right? So the fermentation uh, creates CO2 and that CO2 brings all these uh, skins up. So you have to either pump over or push down to mix these uh, skins with the juice so you can extract color and tannins, right? 
So in the example in here, in the um, Chateau in Margaux in Bordeaux, what you have to do is either, you know, get a paddle and um, punch it down, or you can have a pump and spray the wine all over um, this skins. In the case of the egg, they say it is different. Because of the shape, the CO2 inside the egg will naturally push this cap around the egg. So there is no need for pumping over or punching down. And you can see on the top, you know, it is tighter. So of course, there is no way that I can um, uh, punch down in here, but they say it does the job alone. So, you know, if you don't have to do it, it is even better, right? But the problem of the axe is that it is very, very heavy. So if you need to move from one place to another, you know, it is not an easy thing, um, like stainless steel, right? So, so they are very heavy. So once you said, you know, this is going to be the place that I'll put my egg, it stays there. You don't move it. So it is very, very heavy. Okay. So for both concrete or cement, what they say to the wine is that the wine will be pure. Okay. And that um, the wine will be very fruit forward and maybe we'll have some of the, um, you know, kind of earthy mineral notes uh, from cement. Think about that, okay? Um, okay, so so yes, Christo is asking if the eggs are ma made with cement or concrete. They are made with cement because concrete is too heavy to make the eggs. So, so yes, the eggs are normally cement eggs, okay? The, the other thing in here is that, you know, it is kind of hard to clean, right? Um, it is not as easy as cleaning the um, stainless steel. So think about the eggs. You cannot put hot water because otherwise you run the risk of cracking the tanks. So what you have to do is put water plus a solution with tartaric acid and that, you know, and then scrape the, the sides uh, of the tanks. So yes, it is heavy, difficult to clean, but you know, um, holds the temperature and, um, and you know, very good for red wines because of that, okay? All right, any questions about concrete or cement or can we move on um, to Stainless steel. Okay, so Nicole is asking, um, what is the typical lifespan? I would say for you know the concrete um, tanks is is a lifetime. It is probably 40, 50 years. Um, for the eggs, maybe a little less. And yes, Patra, hot water can crack the egg. Normally not uh, the vessel, not the vats, because they are very hardy. They are concrete, you know, the walls are very thick. So um, yeah. And Patra asked what happens when fermentation brings up temperature to the juice? So what happens is that you're extracting more colors and more flavors. So think about the tea, right? And, you know, probably that was the example that I use in every class for level three, but Think about a bag of tea. If you put that inside um, cold water, you're not extracting anything from the bag of tea. But if you put that into hot water, you extract color, you extract the flavors, and you extract the tannins of that bag of tea. So that is why for red wines, you want to hold this temperature, okay? Um, but doesn't the higher temperature crack the egg? Well, one thing is the temperature of fermentation. So fermentation temperature, you know, for red wines, it's 30, 32 degrees Celsius. So that is what we are talking about. With cleaning, you will need to use a lot higher temperatures. And a lot of people clean vessels with water vapor. So now we are talking, you know, almost 100 degrees Celsius. So, so yeah, when I mean higher temperatures, it's very high. It is not fermentation temperature, okay? All right, um, so let me move on into stainless steel tanks, okay? 
And um, I wanted to put these two pictures in here to kind of shock you. So one uh, is um, stainless steel barrels, which um, maybe you have never seen this and it is quite unusual, right? And the other is massive tanks of stainless steel, okay? Because I know probably most of you during your trips to you know, wine regions, you have seen plenty of stainless steel tanks in different shapes and formats and everything. But you know, um, those things exist. So that is why I wanted to show you, okay? So quickly before you know, we, we go into these examples. So first, it is more economical lasts forever, okay? So stainless steel tanks, you know, unless you have an earthquake or, you know, a natural disaster or something, the tanks will be there, okay? So um, easy to clean, can be heated or cool it. So customization here is, is possible, right? And also if you say, oh yeah, I don't have, you know, the oak flavors, I don't have micro oxygenation, guess what? You can put staves or you can put oak chips inside those tanks and give some oak, oak flavors as well. And you can put, you know, um, some bubbles inside the tank making the micro oxygenation. So stainless steel tanks, it's, it's kind of, you know, it can do it all, right? So even when people, you know, they might not do it, but it can do it, okay? So the, the story about, about stainless steel tanks came only in the 1960s. So for us, it seems like, you know, forever stainless steel tanks for uh, wine fermentation has been around, but it has not. And that came because of the milk industry. And a lot of people, you know, say that it was because of New Zealand and um, in their milk industry, um, they began using that for wine. And so it is a very clean uh, type of ambient. It is a very clean type of winemaking. So now what you want to have, it is fresh, bright fruit, okay? So the wines that are only uh, fermented and aged in stainless steel tanks, they will have this very bright fruit flavors, okay? Um, so stainless steel tanks can go from something like 57 liters, which is a small vessel, all the way into 3 million liters or more, okay? So in the first picture in here for the barrels, that can be used with reds and whites. Um, most of the time it's used with whites because even though it is not a barrel made with oak, you can still have least contacts and batonnage. So, you know, bringing some texture to your wine. So that is why they do the stainless steel um, barrels, okay? And then it is very easy to clean, like you can imagine. Now, the second picture, that is a picture from an Australian winery. So this is massive, right? This is huge. So this was a project, um, you know, to store wine outside. So, um, so yes, it's, it's just, you know, massive, the amount of wine that you can find it in here, okay? So Nicole is commenting, the second picture is what you find behind the employee's door only. Absolutely, okay? So you visit the winery in here, it's all beautiful, all pretty, you have some tanks, and then when you go outside, it's, you know, gigantic. So, so yes, but you know, stainless steel tanks, are really one of the greatest innovations in modern winemaking, simply because you can do, you know, you remove a lot of problems from the wine, a lot of um, the faults, and also uh, you can make a very, you know, bright and fruity um, wine. Think about that, okay? So, but of course, um, we do have some other options for stainless steel fermentation, okay? So one is a lagar. So if you ever been to Portugal or to Dodo, you know that those people use lagares, which are cement or granite tanks, okay? Normally they use granite because it is available in the region. 
But nowadays you have this um, Lagares made of stainless steel tanks. So how cool is that? And you know, Lagares are these tanks that are very shallow because people will do the food trading inside of it. But now instead of being a, you know, a, um, a granite type of vessel, you're using stainless steel tanks. You know, when you finish making your wine, very easy to clean and you can wait for the next year or the next batch. Um, so, and, and that works well also with robotic lagars. Um, so it is, you know, now in common. So I was in Portugal, you know, now with COVID, we always have to think how many years ago, so maybe two years ago. And, you know, you see the traditional uh, lagars that are huge, um, that, you know, many people will be um, doing, um, helping the fermentation, but I have seen a lot of um, stainless steel lagars as well, okay, with robotic, um, robotic lagars is what they call, very interesting. And, and then the second picture in here, this is an actual winery in Bordeaux. So the winery is called La Fleur de Bois. It is in La Lande de Pomerol. So just outside of the Pomerol region. And I was there again, some years ago, we never know right now with COVID. Um, and you know, it is quite dramatic because you enter the winery and you see all of this and you say, I don't understand. Or, you know, what about the barrels? What are the tanks? What is happening in here? So basically the winery is in three um, floors. So the first floor on the top is where you have the tanks. And then on the second floor is what you see here. So you have the bottom of the tanks because they do everything by gravity. So it is kind of a conical shaped tank, right? So on the top you have, you know, everything. So the winemaker can control all the tanks. Then to the bottom, it goes automatically to the second floor. And then on the third floor down, or, you know, should I said the first and second um, garage or, you know, um, under the, the floor. So is where you have the oak barrels. So it is super crazy the way that they do. They have an elevator in here and all these tanks, they're kind of like floating when you go in. So when you see that, you say, wow, you know, so they have this floating uh, stainless steel tanks that can be controlled from, you know, the upper floor. And then on, on the other floor is where you have the oak barrels and everything flows by gravity. They don't use pumps which they say can be too harsh for the wines. So, so, you know, even though stainless steel tanks is something that you say, oh yeah, you know, this tank, I know I have seen it before, there is innovation in that as well, okay? For the format, for the way it is, you know, the shape, um, how they do it, how they assemble it in the winery. So there is a lot of um, innovation in here as well, okay? All right, any other questions so far? Let me check, there is a, um, a question in here. Okay, that is done. Um, okay, so Nicole is asking if stainless steel tanks consume really large amounts of energy. Um, they do if they have, uh, you know, the cooling system and also the system to warm it up, right? If you rely on the temperature of your um, cellar or the outside temperatures, then that is not too bad. But if you rely on heating and cooling up, um, then it can consume a lot of energy. But you know, some of uh, most of the places, so think about that. If you are in Burgundy and you have stainless steel tanks, when you're fermenting your grapes, that will be in October. It is cold. So you don't need to, you know, cool down uh, the system. Okay. So even though it heats up um, a little bit with fermentation, you know, normally you don't need to, but you have the option of doing that. Okay. 
So, so yeah, but, you know, thinking about sustainability, Nicole, and it is Earth Day today, right? Um, so stainless steel, it is a recyclable material, right? So it is easy to clean. You don't have, you know, the pores that, you know, microbes can get inside this pores. And then you need to use, you know, more water or steam to be able to, um, to rinse it. So the more sustainable one is definitely um, stainless steel, I think, okay? And, um, and Cara asked if stainless steels um, won't tame the tenants at all, right? So, you know, now the tanning management here will depend on what you do, right? If you do a lot of pumping over all day, every day, you're extracting the same way. Or if you warm up the tank, right, to 32 Celsius, to 34 Celsius or more, you're creating this ambience to extract more tannins. So, so that is why stainless steel is so flexible. You can do whatever you want. If you don't want to extract any tannins, you know, cool down the temperature, everything is going to be bright and fresh and fruity. If you want to do, you know, very heavy uh, type of lines, you can do as well, okay? Um, all right, so, okay, then we have oak. So, or, you know, other types of wood. And when we talk about the red wine, which is in this case that we have three red wines in front of us, normally we talk about oak um, vats, okay? Not oak barrels, not barriques, but oak vats. Um, so of course, you know, the choice of oak in here is vast. You do have the small barriques with 225 liters. You do have the large fermenters. The origin of oak will determine quality as well. So, you know, we do have French oak, which is the more elegant, the more refined. It'll give flavors of vanilla. And then we have the American oak, which, you know, it's quite refined as well, but it will give more coconut um, aromas, okay? So oak has a lot of benefits. The first benefit is micro-oxygenation. So because it is porous, now during fermentation, these wines are receiving this micro-oxygenation which will allow tannins to soften easily, okay? They do add flavors and texture to the tanning as well. So if it is new oak, it will add a lot. If the oak is heavily toasted, because, you know, then again, the winemaker can choose, oh, I want lightly toasted, medium toasted, and, you know, heavily toasted, just like the toast we do in the morning, right? I like mine lightly toasted. My husband likes heavily toasted. So you can choose the same for your oak um, vessel. And the more, you know, different flavors. But even if you don't have any uh, flavors, if it is a neutral barrel, it gives texture to the wine, okay? And it can give tannins as well. So um, oak has natural tannins, so it will add. Every time that we taste uh, Chardonnay for, um, level three class, and it, it is oak, I make students pay attention that yes, there is oak, um, there is tannin oak in this wine, okay? And um, okay, and but oak, it's very, very, very expensive, okay? And we'll check the prices in a second. So, so Mona is asking a question in here. She's saying, if the benefit of cement ag is the shape, which allows for cap management, do they also have stainless steel eggs for best of both worlds? Very good question, Mona. So, okay, here you go. I have an oak egg for you. But yes, they do it in stainless steel tanks as well. But you know, it is not as effective um, because if you have a large stainless steel tank, you can move things around much faster, right? Eggs are still something that it is kind, it is very manual to do it, right? 
Um, but yes, Mona using the thicket powers uh, discovered that my next slide uh, was going to be uh, this. So this egg in here, which is, you know, beautiful and strange at the same time, right? Um, so that was made by Taran Sod. And Taran Sod is one of the best cooperages in France. Maybe it is the best. So think about the Rolls Royce of cars that is Taran Sod for oak, okay? So this is an egg shaped 2000 liter wooden cask. Um, the name is called Ovum because of course it is an egg. And uh, apparently this was um, made for some producers in Bordeaux, uh, including Domaine de Chevalier, which is in the Pessac Leoyan area in Bordeaux. Um, and the cost of one egg was 30,000 euros. So, you know, to have a lot of eggs for your production, think about that, 30,000 each is a lot. Um, even if it is, you know, larger than oak barrels, um, yes, maybe, you know, you have one for when people to go to your winery, they see it. And then, you know, I was reading some studies and they say that the flavors didn't change dramatically for the oak. So if you want to have the vanilla, the toast, spices, use the oak barrels for now, okay? Um, but also there is some other people using wood that is not oak, okay? So in the picture here to the right, to the left, you see acacia. And acacia is another type of wood that you can use um, to for fermentation or maturation. Acacia has no flavors at all, none. So some producers are using it just because of the texture, okay? So what they say is that, um, for instance, Tablas Creek and Chateau Montelena, they use for their Sauvignon Blanc, not for the oak aromas or not for the wood aromas, just for the texture. Okay, and but it is, you know, um, kind of the price of acacia falls between American oak and French oak. So an American oak barrel probably will cost $600. A French oak barrel probably costs $1,200 and then acacia will be 800. So it is not a cheap barrel and, you know, it is, it is it's not go going to give you any flavors or anything. So, so it is just for texture. But these are options that winemakers are also using, okay? So, so yes, I wanna have oak, but with no flavors just to add some texture to my wine. Or you can you know, pay 30,000 euros for an egg-shaped um, barrel, oak barrel, um, and try to ferment your wine in there, okay? Okay, so yes, but you know, oak is, um, gives you texture, it gives you complexity, gives you a lot of um, different flavors and, um, and aromas, and gives you that micro oxygenation that makes the wine, you know, so more um, ready to drink and so easier to drink. Okay, so any questions about oak before we move on? I think oak is pretty straightforward, right? Because it is what we, you know, are taught, or is what we see in all the wineries and everything. Okay, so Mona is um, is saying that she has a potentially uh, dumb question. I don't think so, but let's see. And Claret is asking for the temperatures. Very good point, Claret. So um, oak is something that the temperature will go as as the wine warms up. Okay, fermentation creates heat, so there is no way that you can cool down the tanks. Maybe if you have AC, you can try to cool down, 
but there is no way just like what you do with stainless steel, you cannot cool down the temperatures dramatically. So fermentation in oak will always be in the warmer side, okay? Um, yeah, so Mona, very good point. She's saying, okay, oak can add tannins, but soften the tannins from the skins. So it adds and subtracts. Yes, very good. Um, it does. So in the case of uh, white wines, white wines do not have tannins, right? Think of a Chardonnay. It doesn't have tannins naturally because you remove the skins before fermentation. So when you put the Chardonnay in oak, zero becomes 10, right? Because now you're adding tannins from the oak. Now, the thing is different than Cabernet Sauvignon because Cabernet Sauvignon already has a ton of, uh, a ton of tannins, right? So let's say you begin with 90. So when you put Cabernet Sauvignon inside an oak barrel, that 90 will be combined with the 10 to form 100, but then you have the microoxygenation. And then you have something else, which is the polymerism. Polymer Sorry. Polyrimis, oh, I cannot say it, but I can write it. Paul, Paul yes, thank you. Paul oh, I cannot say it, you say it. Okay, so you have that as well. So, but I think, you know, the thing about red wines in oak is that they already have a ton of tannins. So the oak tannins that are added are not too much, whereas for white wines, you begin with zero tannins. So if you add a little bit, you fill it, okay? So that is the deal between um, the two of them, okay? Um, all right, so <clears throat> now moving on to the amphoras. So we saw the amphoras at the very beginning um, for the Georgian wines, right? Now we are back seeing the amphoras um, for a more modern style. So producers around the world are using amphora. So I have seen that in the Dodo, Alentejo in Portugal is very famous for using it as well. Um, you know, you see that in Europe, you see in Italy, you see in Slovenia, you see um, in, you know, in the US as well. And it, there is a big movement in Latin America using that. So <clears throat> the pictures in here, so this is De Martino in Chile. So he uses this, what he calls tinajas, which is the anthras, um, just like old times. They, uh, he says that in Chile, that is what, you know, they used to ferment um, hundreds of years ago. Um, and then more modern winemakers um, use amphoras as well. And here on the example in the right um, side, you see Zucardi. So Zucardi in Mendoza, um, he's using this um, amphoras as well. You can make with different materials. <clears throat> the first and more common material is clay. And again, like we said at the beginning, clay is very porous. So wines can have some oxidation, okay? But they will have this texture is, and this kind of earth type of sensation, yes? Um, so now the amphora made with cement, so that will also add texture, but now without adding flavors, okay? but it will make for a very pure wine because now you mix the purity of fruit from the cement, but then you're using the shape of an amphora, which is almost like an egg, right? So it is just, you know, it's almost like an egg. So, so it is a good combination of both. And, um, and by doing this, normally also these winemakers, what they are doing is doing more natural styles of wine. And you know, the way to do natural wines inside amphoras is basically either putting whole bunches inside, 
Um, or some people also um, will use food um, treading for this. So doing it in a very natural way with, you know, um, um, only natural yeast, indigenous yeast, um, whole bunches. So you kind of create a more natural style of wine as well. Okay. Um, so these anthras, they, they are a lot of work as well because, you know, the cap rises. It doesn't have the convection factor of the egg. So the cap rises and you have to break it down twice a day by punching down. Otherwise you run the risk of creating too much pressure and, you know, cracking um, those anthras. So the cap management, especially in red wines is very, very important, okay? Um, so Aga is asking if these can be used for high-end Pinot Noir whole bunch crushed berry fermentation. Absolutely. So De Martino uses for Sanzo. Uh, Zuccardi uses for Malbec. But you know, you can use it with any grape. And normally, Aga is just like you say, it is whole bunch, you know, it is going to be a, a more natural style. But yes, definitely Pinot um, can be used for that as well. Okay. So, so yes, you know, the difference between doing whole bunch in stainless steel tank is that you have a very pure fruit. And in this case, you have, you know, a fruit with a little bit more texture, more rustic. Um, I think rust rusticity is the word that describes this, okay? So, okay, uh, Carr is saying that he knows a winemaker in Willamette Valley playing with Anfra with Pinot. Very interesting. What is the name of the winery? Can you share? But, you know, I think Minimus. Okay, I'll look that up. Um, interesting. So, yes, but nowadays, all these winemakers, um, they are trying to, um, you know, to play with all these materials. How can I make my wine better or different or, you know, the style that I want? And, um, and then, you know, you use all these materials, okay? So Chad Stock is the winemaker. Okay, I'll look it up. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, no, very, very cool. Okay. Okay, any um, other questions in here before we move on? Let me check if I missed something. Um, yeah, so so think about that, that, um, you know, of course, to make good wine, you have to start with good fruit. So that is mandatory. But then choosing the different materials, shapes, sizes, and everything, that is your seasoning, right? It is just like a chef choosing what to use. Um, and I think it is very interesting, this movement that, you know, we saw in the 80s and the 90s, a lot of use of oak, very powerful wines. And now we are going back into seeing some more balanced wines and different materials. So, you know, maybe producers do not want to do Chardonnay in oak only. Maybe producers do not want to do, you know, their red wines in oak only. They can use different materials, but achieve the same quality. So, um, so this is what's making it very, very interesting. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, not a problem. So, um, Car is saying he's using the Amphora for Sauvignon Blanc, not Pinot. But it's okay. So he's using um, for Sauvignon Blanc as well, which is highly unusual, right? Normally Sauvignon Blanc, you wanted to have, you know, the, a lot of fruit. And so if you're using amphora, you're adding some texture as well. Okay. So um, I grew up um, in Brazil. So it was very common for us to have, uh, to drink water from um, kind of, you know, a mini amphora made of uh, clay. They call it talha um, in, in Portuguese. So, you know, that texture that the water had and that freshness that the water had, it's, um, it is just something very different. So, so yes, so that is, you know, for the wine, it is going to be the same, okay? 
All right, so um, having said that, now we have to taste the wines, okay? So um, the wines, like I said, they are blind. They are blind to you guys. They are blind to, to me as well. Uh, but I will share some, you know, the region and the grape for the wines, okay? So we do have three wines blind in here. And all the wines are from, do you recognize this region? Yep, very good. This is Mendoza in Argentina. Okay, so this is a picture of the Uco Valley. So um, very dramatic type of scenery, right? You have the Andes Mountains really high, blue skies, you know, the Andes Mountains, they act like a rain shadow. So you have a very long rain in Mendoza and then you have the very green vineyards. So beautiful place and you, you are on altitude as well, okay? So all three wines are from Mendoza, okay? So, um, and all three wines are from Uco Valley. So Uco is one hour south of the city of Mendoza. It is the um, highest area in elevation within Mendoza. So elevation in here range from 850 meters, 2000 feet to 1100 meters, 3600 feet, which is a lot. Um, Diurnal range in Mendoza, it is also very important. So ha you have very warm days, which will ripe the tannins and very cool nights, okay? So huge diurnal range of temperature. That will allow tannins to ripen because you have the warm, but also retains acidity because you have the very cool nights, okay? Um, yeah. I like that. Aga says the altitude is relative to its anagram latitude. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and then in Uco Valley, we do have alluvial soils, but a very stony type of soils. Some stones are calcareous, some are, are not, but you know, very stony type of soils. So from the subregions in Mendoza, um, Uco Valley is definitely the top one. Um, all the wineries that were in the Maipu or in Luján, um, closer to the city, they have moved to the Uco Valley, okay? In the picture in here, that is the new winery from Zucardi in the Uco Valley. Um, when I visited Zucardi, now I have to seriously think, maybe five years ago or so? Yeah, five makes sense. Five, six years ago. They were still in Luján, um, where they have Santa Julia, and, um, and they were, you know, about to open this winery or finishing something like this, but it was kind of far away. We never went to visit, uh, but it's super beautiful. So all these high-end wineries, they now have, um, they have, you know, cellars and wineries in Uco Valley because it is one of the top regions now because of this urinal range, the elevation and the alluvial soils, okay? So all three wines are from Zucardi. All three wines are made in Uco Valley, okay? Now the grape, do you wanna guess the grape? It's an easy one, right? Okay, so the grape is Malbec. Um, yes, thank you, Lisa. So the grape is Malbec. So Malbec is native to Bordeaux and it was heavily planted in Bordeaux until um, Bordeaux had a frost, 1956, if I'm not mistaken. And, um, you know, and, and they didn't replant it until now. So Argentina, um, it's, definitely Argentina's flagship grape. Uh, Malbec has had a huge success in Argentina because of this um, very sunny climate, right? Um, and for the aromas that we have to look for the Malbec, it is, you know, this very rich aromas of um, 
cocoa, dark fruits, some violets, especially in a higher elevation, the wines can be very floral. And then, you, you know, you can have plums, dark plums, blackberry, and even blue fru fruits uh, like blueberry, okay? Um, the wines will be dry. And, you know, all these wines in here, I was checking technical sheets, they have one gram of, of sugar, two grams, so it is imperceptible. So the wines are dry with high levels of tannins, okay? Um, acidity can, can be, you know, medium to medium plus, depending on the wine. It will never be high uh, because Malbec doesn't have a high acidity, but you do have the diurnal range that will keep the acidity, okay? So, okay, three Malbecs, all from Mendoza, all from Valle de Uco, all from Zucardi. So what's different? So the difference now is the um, winemaking, okay? So one wine um, has been made mostly in, um, in cement, vats, the other one in amphora, and the other one in oak barrels, okay? So before, you know, I, I share um, the technical stuff into the wines, I would like you to taste all three wines if you haven't. So I'll give you a minute and, um, you know, and we can start with number one, number two, and number three. So we can discuss aromas and flavors and um, what's different and what's similar. Um, so Joya is asking me if there are any red or white wines with zero or extremely low acidity. Um, very low acid for whites, maybe give or um, but you know, zero, or are you asking zero sugar? Um, and then she's saying, does it help if you drink organic wine? Um, the acidity. No, every wine will have acidity. So wine is um, in itself an acid solution. Uh, it's, it has, you know, much more acidity than sake, has much more acidity um, than, you know, a lot of drinks. So wine is acidic as, as a solution. Um, and, you know, usually the higher the acid, the fresher and the easier to pair. So I, for instance, I love high acid wines like Riesling, like a Chablis, like Italian white wines. All of these are high in acid and I simply love them. Nebbiolo has high acid, Cabernet Sauvignon has high acid and, um, and all of that is very good. With organic, um, normally not, um, you know, it wouldn't impact the level of acidity, okay? All right, so let me stop sharing for a second. So I can, you know, see you and we can taste together. Um, so, so yes, and you know, there are some people in here that do not have the wines. So for those of you who do not have the wines, um, these wines will be pouring on Saturday. Um, at three or five wines. On Saturdays, we always have free tastings. So I will use those three wines um, and pour it for free. So if you wanna stop by, taste the three wines, if you haven't, you know, by all means, just go there, okay? All right, so um, please taste um, wine number one. Okay, and Lisa is saying she's hopping on a plane now. All right, so have a safe trip, Lisa. Um, thank you for joining us. And Mona says she was at the shop a couple of Saturdays ago to taste the Georgian wines. Yes, definitely interesting. I like the white better than the red. Uh, the red was so rustic, um, but yeah, thank you. But the wines will be there, okay? Okay, so um, go ahead and let me know what you think about wine one.
Okay. Yes. So Car is saying repetenance. And I do agree. It's it's very fruity, right? It's super fruity, dark fruits. I totally agree. Um, but it is very high and grippy tannins. So you feel the tannins, you know, in your gums um, and in the sides of your cheeks. But yes, I I do agree, Patra. Pure fruit, right? So do you think there is any oak in this wine? Any of you saw vanilla, spices, anything? No, right? So, so yes, for me either. I couldn't find any aroma of... Um, vanilla or spices or anything, okay? Okay, so Mona thinks that this might be the answer I want. Okay, let's see later, but can be a candidate for anthra, absolutely. Um, you know, so, so yes, first deep purple color, okay? So very um, notes of very dark fruits. So dark blackberry, dark plums. Um, so no vanilla, no oak in this wine. Very dry, very high, kind of, you know, creepy, rustic tannins. Super concentrated type of wine. I'm looking at my notes in here. And the wine is kind of tight. Right, so so it is not a kind of smooth because you know when we think about Malbec, especially coming from from Argentina, right? If you buy a bottle of um, fourteen dollars Malbec, it is smooth, and this one is tight. Okay, so so okay. Um, Lisa is thinking cement. Patra saying it's cement, hundred percent. Okay. I do, uh, I saw, I, I put cement on my notes, but I'm not always 100% Patra because blind tasting is so tricky. We never know, okay? So, okay. So that is wine one, okay? Uh, Claudia also thinks it is um, cement. Gloria thinks it's cement, okay. So what we know so far is that definitely not oak, okay? So either can be cement or can be the amphora, okay? Uh, Eduardo is saying the amphora because of the rusticity. And I, you know, that is why I put cement, but I put a question mark because yes, I do feel those um, rustic tannins, okay? Um, so car, there is no option of stainless steel. So in here is either cement Amphora or, you know, cement plus oak. So these are the three options. So yes, no stainless steel. I'll make your life easier. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, all right. So let's see wine number two. Okay. So go ahead, taste wine number two. And tell me what you think. Ah, this is different, so different. Um, okay. Okay, I like the comments in here. Please comment to everybody so everybody can see the notes. So I'm gonna read, um, Mona said, oak. Mona, why? Give me the why. Uh, Kari is saying the fruit is a lot more muted. So I think there's still fruit, but you're right. There's something else in here, okay? So AJ is saying that he thinks uh, it is oak even before tasting based on the color. So what did you see about the color, AJ? Let us know. And Eduardo is saying smooth. I like that. Yes, I completely agree. The wine is so smooth. 
So Mona is saying it is the smell, chocolate. Um, Natalie is saying there is cocoa, number two, and the texture is different. And I totally agree, right? Um, AJ is saying there is a deeper browner reddish hue compared to the other, which have more pinkish tones. Okay, I like that. Give me one second because I need to compare my wines because I'm learning to, you know? So, okay, I see what you mean. Yes, when you compare, the first wine is more pink on the rim and this one um, is kind of more red, more brown, more kind of concentrated too. Yep, oak does add some color as well, right? So an oak Chardonnay versus an un -oak Chardonnay, you see the deeper color in the oaked one as well, okay? So um, for people who do not have the wines, so for me, this wine is deep purple. You have a lot of black and blue fruits. So think about blackcurrant, blackberry, blueberry. There is vanilla in here. On the nose, I can smell the vanilla. And also I can smell the spices. So there is some clove and nutmeg. Uh, so that is making me think that the wine has oak. When I taste the wine on the palate, um, the wine is dry and, um, you know, has a medium plus acidity, which is expected. But what, what I put down, it is high silky tannins. The tannins are high, but they are so smooth and silky, okay? So, um, and for me, this wine is more complex than wine number one complex in terms of aromas and flavors. I'm not saying it is better. I'm not saying, you know, um, it's the best wine, but I'm just saying it is more complex because of this, okay? So yes, Lisa, you're right. Uh, we all are thinking about oak. Um, Car is saying definitely vanilla, so okay. Um, Claudia says there is some earthy notes on the nose as well, yeah. Definitely, we have that. So if this is the cement plus oak, so yes, you do have, you know, some of the earthy notes of the cement because it was fermented in cement and then aged in oak barrels or in oak vessels, okay? Yeah, so Claudia is saying cement or clay plus oak. I agree with you, Claudia. Mm -hmm. Okay, yep. Okay, before tasting number three, go back to wine number one and try to see the texture of the tannins, just to see the difference in, in texture. We use um, rustic for wine number one. We use smooth and silky for wine number two. But just to, you know, go back to it because um, it might be even um, Yeah, rustic, Lisa, in the sense of more grippy tannins, not as smooth and silky as wine number two. So more grippy, yeah, definitely is. Um, all right, so let's go into wine number three and um, please taste the wine and let me know what you think. It is a different nose, um, AJ. Okay, so some mushrooms. What else do you have? Okay, so some people are saying that the nose is muted and some people are saying that the nose is beautiful on, on wine three. So maybe, you know, go ahead and taste the wine.
Okay. Yes, uh, more violet on the nose, um, says Eduardo. It is floral. Yes, it is more floral as well. Okay. So what about the tenons in here? Because they're high, right? And they are grippy as well. They are, you know, all over my, my mouth. Yep, I agree with the violet and floral notes. Claudia, mm -hmm. and there's there's something herbal that I wrote down in here as well. So I did feel the herbal kind of character of the wine, and plus um, what I wrote down as a type of aroma, I wrote um, red clay because it, it was almost like smelling, you know, a pot, a piece of pottery in here, okay? So Lisa, Lisa, do you work in the industry by any chance? Because, you know, if you're not, you're ready. So she's saying that if there is the, the mushroom, herbal, earthy, a um, muted type of aroma pointing to natural tannins, which points to whole bunches. She's thinking amphora. Um, I'm thinking the same thing, Lisa, very good notes. And I did put whole cluster um, question mark in here on my notes as well. Because yes, I did feel this kind of more natural wine vibe to this wine than the others. I know. So Lisa doesn't have the wines. She's just hearing everything, condensing and putting together uh, what you think it is. Yeah. And I agree. It is a complex nose. Um, very interesting in here. Yeah. So, you know, go back to the nose of wine one and just smell to see how wine one now suddenly became uh, fruity and simple. And wine three, it's floral, it's perfumed, it is um, much more, yeah, it's super elegant. Yep. Okay, um, so I, I will share my screen again but I will not share the results yet. I will share the technical sheets of the wine. And then based on the technical sheets, maybe we can put things in places, okay? So um, let me go ahead and share the presentation again. Um, so this, all right, so this is not in order, okay? So I'm just sharing what the wines are, and then we will organize. So one of the wines is Jose Zucar de Malbec 2015. It's 95% Malbec with 5% Cabernet Sauvignon. So there's a tiny portion of cap. Valle de Uco in Paraje Altamira in Guatalari. 14.5% uh, alcohol, fermentation in concrete vats and aging in oak food dress. Food dress are the larger um, oak barrels, okay? So one of the wines is this. So concrete vats, oak food dress, and a little bit of Cabernet Sauvignon, okay? One of the wines, we don't know which one is which, is the Zucardi Concreto Malbec 2019. So this is 100% Malbec from uh, Paraje Altamira, and this is coming from the Finca, sorry for the typo, Finca Piedra Infinita, which is one of the wines from Zucardi that got 100 points. 13.5% um, alcohol. I want to check the bottle because um, that was on the technical sheets. Fermentation in concrete vats, no epoxy, so raw concrete, nude concrete. 50% whole cluster. Okay, now I'm confused. Um, aging in concrete vats, okay? So concrete only in here, 50% whole cluster. And then one of the wines is the Zucardi Anfora Project Malbec 2018. 100% Malbec, 
same vineyard as the Concreto, Paraja Altamira Finca Piedra Infinita, 14.5% alcohol. And this is a low intervention wine. Fermentation and aging in Amphora using whole cluster, native yeast, and everything that is natural, okay? He made one Amphora only. So this is a highly you know, rare and allocated wine. Um, so that is why the price for the wine is so high as well. So now that you know um, what it is, you know, I'll, I'll put a poll, so don't say it now, okay? You can vote because this is a democracy and we can all um, put our opinions, but just go back and say, okay, so one has Cabernet Sauvignon and, you know, oak. So which one is this? Then the other one, you know, has whole clusters, but it's all concrete. And the other one has whole cluster, but it's amphora and it is low intervention. So try to see that. And meanwhile, let me check all the messages in here. Um, okay. Okay, so Lisa is saying um, the floral notes and perfumes reflect the fruit itself and not the vessel. Absolutely, but whole cluster normally gives a lift, a floral aromas to the wine. So, or, you know, high altitude. In this case, all three have high altitudes, um, but probably the whole cluster on the concreto or the amphora is giving the floral notes, okay? So wine number three might be one of them. Um, so Mona saying, I'm guessing greater oxygenation mutes the fruitiness and lets the violence notes be more prominent. No, so floral notes are the more volatile. So, you know, they go quickly um, if you put something. So if the fermentation temperature is very warm, the floral notes are the first ones to go. So in the case of oak, you rarely would have uh, those notes, okay? Um, yep, so AJ is saying, yeah, that blend is, you know, it's, it's a tiny portion of Cabernet Sauvignon, but it does give something else to the wine. Okay. Um, okay. So AJ is saying that if it is the blend is like this, he got serious cab Sauvignon vibes on wine number two. Okay. So, all right. Um, so let me know if you need another moment. Otherwise, I will um, I will put the poll, and we can all vote and see what the wines are. And again, for those of you who do not have the wine, stop by 305 Wines on Saturday and taste for free. So you can compare and contrast. Um, all right, so I'm gonna launch poll um, and just, you know, let's see what wine number one is, fermented and aged in which material for wine one? Do you think it is oak? Do you think it is concrete vax or do you think it is amphora? Okay. So I needed that music with the, you know, kind of tick tock. Um, so go ahead and vote. Yeah, the Jeopardy 10. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Nicole. Exactly. So, okay. I'm gonna give you, you know, a few more seconds for you to vote on wine one. And then I'm gonna close. Um, oh my, so different they are. Same grape, same winemaker, same everything. The wines are so, so different. All right, so I'm gonna end the poll in here and share the results. Um, so yes, most of you said concrete vats uh, for wine one, and it was really my guess. And you know, in the Master of Wine program, they say um, you have to taste like a detective and prove like a lawyer. So my way of proving that this wine is concrete vats 
is first that you have, you know, um, this kind of um, tight and rustic type of tannins. And then you have a very fruity palette with no oak. Um, and you don't have the natural winemaking that we find um, on wine number three. So I think wine number one is also the concrete. So let's see, should I open my wine in here and review? Okay, so I see a winner. Let me stop sharing the results in here. Okay. All right, so wine one, it's really Zucardi Concreto. And you can see on the label is, okay. Guilherme did a nice job in here. I cannot open, you know, maybe it was for me not to seriously open the wines. Okay. So wine one is Zucardi Concreto Malbec. So it is the one, um, and let me share the screen again, that we see in here in the middle, 100% Malbec from Valle de Uco, fermentation in concrete vats, 50% um, whole cluster and aging in concrete. The bottle says 14% um, alcohol. So yes, a little bit more than 13.5, okay? So great job on that. Um, now we have to find number um, two and number three. So what are the guesses? What do you think is number two? Yep. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I do think it is the oak one as well. You know, the notes of vanilla and spice, uh, they are very different. Um, also, I found the wine more complex in terms of aromas because you do have the oak and you do have high tannins, but the tannins are silky. So I guess, you know, the micro oxygenation from the oak made that wine, yes, very high in tannins, but still silky, okay? So that was my guess as well. And um, so let's see, what is wine number two? And yeah, you're all right, because this is Jose Lucardi, Valle de Uco. 95% Malbec, 5% um, Cabernet Sauvignon, okay? So, so yes, great job. Very good job. Perfect. You guys are on fire, you know? So that means wine number three is um, the um, one fermented in Amphora, okay? So the what was for me in here first it was the herbal notes and this very floral notes and all of you said that you know it was kind of unanimous um we all said floral and this floral is brought by the whole cluster so and then you know aj and patra and you know for the people who love the nose the aromas on wine three think about using natural yeast right it gives more complexity of flavors so definitely you have all these flavors on the nose um, because of this natural yeast. Okay, so this is the Zucardi um, Amphora. Okay, it is one Amphora, number 128, giving you this wine. And, and yes, the tannins for me in here were very, very high, but you know, creepy. They weren't silky as wine number two. So, you know, not that micro oxygenation from oak, and I did have, um, you know, powerful wine, uh, structure wine, and that kind of um, herbal type of note, okay? So let me read what you're saying um, in the comments in here. 
Um, yeah, so AJ is saying that he's a newbie to this, um, but the funky notes uh, correspond to Amphra. So yeah, okay, very good. Um, yeah, no, you nailed it. And, you know, even though when people are very skeptic saying, oh no, you cannot taste the difference. You cannot smell the difference. We just proved them wrong, right? You can uh, smell and taste the difference from uh, these two wines, okay? Um, so good question, Lisa. She's asking if um, the funky notes could come from whole cluster too, regardless of the vessel. Yeah, absolutely. If you do whole cluster in, you know, stainless steel tanks with open top, you don't want to do carbonic maceration, which is, you know, another way, um, another thing for the winemakers to do. Uh, but yes, you can get the funky notes with natural yeast, um, even in, in, in other vessels. Patra, yes, all pass with 100%, you know, pass with distinction. Great job. Um, yes. So, so you know, um, Sebastian Zuccardi, which is uh, the guy now responsible for this, so he's saying that he's moving to low intervention wines, right? So that is why the Amphora project, it was kind of one Amphora that had a very distinctive um, nose and they decided to bottle it. Um, so the Concreto is an expensive wine, it's 30 something dollars, which for a Malbec is a lot, but the, the Anfora is $82 or you know around $80. So think about that when people see it, oh, Anfora, Malbec, $80, I'm not paying this, right? Um, but it's very low intervention. Everything has to be done you know, by hand, um, so that is what makes um, it very, very, you know, different, special and pricey at the same time, okay? But yes, same grapes, um, you know, grapes for Concreto and grapes for Amphora are the same vineyards. Um, and then just, you know, different type of winemaking um, in here. Yeah. Okay, yes, so Eduardo says, um, awesome wines, great experience. Yes, now, you know, I did Corv in my wines um, so I can have them later uh, with, you know, a piece of steak or some grilled vegetables for sure. Okay, but yes, I do agree with you that, you know, three great wines, uh, very different styles, one for each moment, okay? So, yes. Thank you, Aga. Stop by the shop, taste the wines later. And, you know, for one last thing, if you want to tell me what would you pair and which wine we'll be drinking tonight or tomorrow, because it is Friday tomorrow. So, yeah. I like all three of them, but I think, you know, the Concreto is fruitier. Maybe I'll put um, a few minutes on the fridge. Yes, definitely the, the Jose Zucardi, you know, needs uh, Parilla. So yes, okay. Port Lomain for Mona, love that. Skirt steak and Papa's Bravas, oh, fantastic, Natalie. I'm hungry now. We all need some food, right? Um, okay. Um, yeah, all right. And okay, so, Thank you so much, guys. Um, you know, so like I said, the upcoming webinar, so Nicole does a webinar tomorrow uh, with Sparking Rosé webinars, and I will be back in the classroom. There is a Riesling um, seminar in person. I'm putting 11 wines, but it's sold out. But I will do a Rhone uh, Valley um, webinar, a seminar at the Florida Wine Academy in downtown Miami. So, you know, stay tuned for the emails because as the classes are small, these are filling up really fast. And I'll think about some other, you know, themes for us to, to do some fun webinars as well, okay? And I do accept suggestions. So um, whatever you wanna do. All right, so thank you so much guys. And I will see you all very soon. Cheers, stay safe, cheers guys.